What does happiness mean to you? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I wrote a book on this actually called The, the Law of Happiness. Um, and the reason I wrote the book was, and you know, we have a lot of people tune in this program that um, love science because, you know, I'm a psychologist. I live in the research. I read it all the time and believe in evidence-based treatments and modalities. And we want to always be connected to the science of what we're trying to do and the research that validates what works and does it, and all that. And the other side of the equation is that with, with all the science and psychological research, psychiatric research, performance research is the world I live in, but I also live in the faith world. And there's a faith uh, you know, perspective of seeing all this as well. Now, here's what happened to me. Uh, I don't know exactly what year it was. It wasn't that many years ago. Um, I had the publisher, if any of you guys remember the book, The Secret, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, Secret took everybody by storm, the law of attraction. You know, if you think about a Rolls Royce, it's going to show up in your driveway kind of thing. And um, the publisher of The Secret asked me to write the Christian version of The Secret. And they said, well, you know, The Secret, um, you know, they, they started talking about all this, this biblical stuff. And I said, well, I don't exactly know. Let me go read it and I'll see. <laughs> but I went and read it and, and I, I came back and said, you know, there, there are some, there are some, thoughts in here that that do coincide with some things in the bible but by and large uh there is a big difference in what the the bible would say the secret to life is um versus the secret and so i said um let me approach it from that way and i wrote a book called the secret things of god and in that book i talked about what i believe the bible reveals as the secrets, you know, as Paul put it in Corinthians, um, to life, a bunch of them. Now, that book uh, became really popular. And so they asked me, they said, well, kind of in this space, what do you want to write on next? And this is when I get to the science of the Bible. I said, you know, it's really interesting. I have been spending the last uh, probably year and a half at that time, my main focus of studying the scientific research was in the field of happiness or thriving or what is sometimes referred to as that whole ball of wax is positive psychology. You know, the APA president Martin Seligman stood up years ago and said, you know, psychology has been studying the negative side of life for a hundred years and we've gotten really good at it. Depression, anxiety, addictions, trauma. We've gotten pretty good at solving, you know, these clinical problems. But why haven't we ever studied the positive side of life? Why don't we don't even know what makes people happy? We know what makes them depressed and how to get them undepressed, but we don't know what makes them happy. Why don't we go study that? And the whole field followed his call. And for, you know, gosh, it's been way over a decade now, maybe when they started that, um, two decades, maybe. I don't exactly remember the year that he did this, but gosh, it went around the world. And basically, you, you go to any, any top university, you know, graduate schools in psychology, they're going to have a, they're going to have a, a, a program in positive psychology. And what, and you know, one of the, one of the areas of that is this thing called, we call happiness. And what they found in this research, and I want to just start out by giving you, um, this is why I'm talking about this today, because I came across some research last week about this um that was just talking about happiness in general and it's a big deal people and what i mean by happiness is positive feelings you know positive they define it as positive affect you know when we're kind of when our mood is is light and when it's up and when we're engaged and and you're just kind of happy. It doesn't mean you're, you know, psychologically orgasmic all the time. It just means, you know, positive feelings, right? 
guess what? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Not only, obviously, you enjoy life more when you're happy, but empirically, here's what the science shows. That when people have positive affective states, feeling states, their performance on problem solving and tasks and achievement is higher. I mean, a happy football team, they really love being together and love what they're doing. They're going to do better on the field than people that are worried and stressed out and negative and pessimistic and all of that. Now, I'm not talking about clinical issues. If you're depressed and anxious, you know, that's a different issue. You know, that needs to be treated. But I'm just talking about in life. You know, some people, they're not depressed, but they're, we really wouldn't call them as full of joy, right? So your performance goes up in life. They've actually, you know, correlated it with levels of success. Problem solving. Are you ready for this one? Okay, and they actually controlled for other stuff like exercise and all that. A longer life. Because unhappiness gets at, you know, like the Bible says, it, it eats at your bones, right? Laughter is good medicine. You know, there's a lot of biochemistry that happens in our mood. So a longer life, your immune functioning, for example. A lot of different stuff goes into this happiness thing. And it's really, really important. So I want to hop over on the faith side for a second. This is something I've seen for the last, since I've been in this, well, since I've been following Jesus. When I first started following Jesus seriously, and I started reading all this Christian stuff, happiness, there is a belief in the Christian world that happiness is not something you should shoot for. You ever heard that? Because happiness is related to circumstances. But joy, now if you're really spiritual, you won't worry about happiness, you'll have joy. Now, there's a certain part of that that I understand. And when they say it's happiness is about your circumstances, if things go well, you're happy. If they go down, you're not. That is absolutely not true. And it's not true that happiness gets a bad rap in the Bible. If you go way back to Deuteronomy, when Moses gave the whole law, this is why I called the book, The Law of Happiness. When he gave the whole law, they said, what's the meaning by law, all of God's principles? What's the meaning of all this religious stuff that we follow and look at? Why are we doing this? He said, look, guys, we were slaves in Egypt, unhappy. <laughs> slaves in Egypt. You know, remember under Pharaoh, right? Some of you feel like you work under Pharaoh now. You're in an oppressive work situation. You know what that feels like. And it says that, you know, we were slaves in Egypt. God brought us out with a mighty hand. God delivers. God delivered me from unhappiness. God does this when we ask him. He reaches into our life and he brings us to a different place. And then he says this, and then he gave us all these principles. And he said, if you follow these, you know, these will become our righteousness, he said. But why did God give us these principles? Interesting, if you go back to that passage there where Moses is giving this big speech, he says, God gave us these principles so that we would walk in these ways so that we might always prosper. We might always prosper. Interesting word. Now we know what it can mean, but doesn't mean. It doesn't mean everybody's going to be, you know, a billionaire. That's not what it means. The Hebrew word there is a word that means this holistic thriving, that life will have this thriving nature to it and be fruitful. Good relationships, feel better you know, problem solve, finding your talents and gifts and engaging in them, having deeper connections, all of this kind of fulfillment stuff. Well, that's what the happiness research is talking about. Now, about this stuff about, well, happiness is circumstantial, but joy goes, I get it. 
Okay, I get it. I'm not poo-pooing the whole concept in this way, but this is also where they're wrong. Because, and this is where you get into semantics too, because when they say happiness is circumstantial, you know what the research shows? All this research from around the world for now a couple of decades? Are you ready for this? Happiness, only 10% of anybody's happiness has anything to do with their circumstances. 10%. Something good happens, we get a little bump, you get a new car, or you get the job you wanted, or you get the house you wanted, or you move in the neighborhood you wanted, or you win that game or whatever. Yeah, we get a bump. It is circumstantial. They're right about that, but it's only about 10%. And here's the thing, and this is kind of like a lot of the Christians say, it doesn't last. See, the bump goes up. This is what the research shows. The circumstantial bump goes up. You know, you go on, you know, you see a TV ad. Oh, I want that. And you order it. And you can't wait till it arrives. And then, it, yeah, it goes up. There's a new car smell. Yeah, it feels good. Wonderful. Enjoy it. But guess what? The new car smell goes away and you go back down to what's called a set point. A set point. It's like the thermostat in your house or apartment. If you got it set at 68 degrees or 70 degrees, you can open up the door in the winter if you live in Wisconsin and you'll have a circumstantial change for a minute. You close the door, but it's going to go back to that set point or vice versa if you, you know, <clears throat> Interesting. I saw on the news this morning that in Sicily it's like 116 degrees today. Crazy. You open the door there, that house is going to have a change, a circumstantial change for a minute. But you're going to go back down to a set point. Somebody falls in love, they're going to have circumstantial change, but then they're going to, you know, ether is going to wear off and now you find yourself with a real person and so what happens then well, a lot of times it goes well sometimes it doesn't see circumstance this this stuff it's only 10 percent. but here's what they find about true happiness and this is in part what you know go back to the christian thing joy whatever we call thriving it's very very important you know the bible is clear about negative feelings negative affect now, I'm not talking about real stuff like, you know, like we feel our real feelings that can be life giving, but worry and stress and and toxic kind of stuff that goes on in relationships and bitterness and all of that, that will make us sick. We know that. Was it 90 percent or so of all illness has some kind of factor in it about all that. So you go back to the set point. And then what? Where does happiness come from? Well, 90% of it comes from something other than circumstances. Well, here's what the research shows. Part of it comes from kind of how we're wired. And, you know, now we know from neuroplasticity and a bunch of other stuff that even our temperament, and I've worked with people and they're, they're wiring like changes, you know, some of it's biological, some of it's temperament, some of it's how they're glued together. They kind of call that, well, that's kind of what the cards you're dealt. I, I believe because I've seen, and also there's stuff to validate this. I think even that can be changed, but setting that aside, because that's debatable with some people, but the other big chunk that causes happiness and this is why I entitled the book, The Law of Happiness. The other big chunk, where that set point, you're going to return to a set point of who you are as a person, not a moral judgment, but just kind of what our set point of happiness is. And that set point comes from a set of life practices that happy people do and unhappy people do don't do life practices in other words 
we don't have a lot of control of our circumstances a lot of times. We do have control of ourselves and how we relate to those circumstances. Our attachment to those circumstances, our framing of those circumstances, our interpretation of those circumstances, our engagement, disengagement, there's a lot that goes on why people in the same circumstance, some of them can be happy and some of them can be unhappy. So when I wrote the book, The Law of Happiness, and I talked to the publisher, and this talked about the science and the faith, here's what happened to me as a social scientist. When I read the research, and I was just trying to learn the research. As, as I said, I spent a year and a half deep in this stuff. When I read the research, I felt like I was reading the Bible. Because these factors, these life practices that make people happy, those were the ones that Moses was talking about that when God gave us all these practices, it was so we would thrive. So I'm just going from little research that I read, uh, you know, to prompt this kind of thought today. And in the book, I've got, um, I think I took the top 10 or 12 of these things in the law of happiness. But the article that I read um, is actually, I can even, uh, uh, who wrote this article? Well, I'd have to, anyway, it's a compilation of a lot of research. It's findable, the research is. Um, they listed a few of the factors that really load on high degrees of well being. I'm going to start with the number one, um, and I say it's number one because a lot of research has pointed this out. You know, Harvard did a 75-year study on what is the what produces a successful life. Number one factor: the quality of people's close relationships, without a doubt, and. When I say close, it's not just maybe a spouse or, you know, whoever in, you know, that one person. It's kind of like this circle of the community, the network that we actually live and thrive in. That determines everything. It's health, it's finances, it's mood, it's a bunch of stuff. And when I say finances, I don't mean rich or, rich or poor as much as I mean, whatever, however somebody defines it for them, that they're fruitful, you know, their finances work for them. You know, there are people that have gazillions and their finances don't work for them. They never make them happy. They're always stressed about it. They're greedy, they're, you know, and there's people that don't have much that, but they have what they need, you know, to do the things they need in life. And that's what the research shows that these factors kick in with a certain level of security. You know, we need food, we need shelter, and we need, you know, a certain level, but it levels out. I think the last research I saw said that happiness tends to level out at about, in the United States, at about $60,000 a year. It doesn't become much of a factor in how, in, you know, after that. You can go go read the research and see how they come up with that. But the point is, it's not all about being rich or poor. It's about you, we need to have our needs met, I'm not discounting that. But it's relationships that usually cause that to happen anyway. You know, that's who trains us, mentors us, teaches us to be successful. Yeah, teach, teaches our relationships, teach us to be successful. We learn things. We learn how to manage money. We learn how to bunch of stuff it's your relationships you can't do that in a vacuum so relationships affect the 360 circle number one number two i'm just just list a couple more for you to think of acts of kindness happy people are givers they do stuff for other people those are the happiest people now that is a caveat because codependents do a bunch of stuff for other people too, but it doesn't produce joy, 
or happiness. Because codependents are doing it, certainly have good motivations, but they're also enabling a lot of people and they don't have control of the outcome. The outcome's never good. So the giving becomes poison, poisoned. It doesn't give the joy when you're enabling somebody and giving in. You're not really giving anyway, you're giving in. Or giving into pressure. Can't say no. Well, I'm giving, giving, giving. Yeah, but it doesn't feel good. I'm not happy about it. Why? Because we didn't really want to do it. Giving in ways you don't want to do. There's nothing wrong with not wanting to give to a particular. You're not selfish for saying no to somebody's request. Selfishness is about when you never have yeses. It's not about your no's. Somebody wants to some of your time or energy or money or whatever didn't really fit your purposes in terms of where you want to give and you say, well, you know, it's a great, but I, you know, I can't do that that day or, you know, I'm doing something else. And we say, no, is that selfish? Well, a codependent's head certainly will tell them it's selfish to not do what somebody wants. Sure. will. But that's not selfish. Selfishness is when it's all about you all the time. You, we know people like that. They never do anything for anybody else. It's always, it's always no if it's somebody else. Wants. All the yeses are about what's in it for me. Well, that's not a happy person. So we need to be looking at how much are we giving? Do you know that when you write a check to a charity, this will blow your mind. When you write a check to a cherry or you give somebody something, give them a gift or whatever, do you know the same pleasure centers light up in your brain when they do a brain scan on this, on this stuff? When you give somebody something, the same pleasure centers light up in your brain as when you are eating good food or having sex. Food and sex and giving. Remember, I was talking about this one time to an audience. I said, you know, if you could find a way to, to give some money and, you know, order some pizza and eat it while you're at the same time, do all having sex and giving and eating all at the same time, we might never find you again. You just might take off into the sky. You'd be so happy. Giving is a big deal. God wired it in the pleasure centers of our brain, the science, the physiology, the neuroscience, when we give chemicals are excreted and make us happy but let me get to the other factor that i want to mention this morning self-determination agency purposefulness when you feel like you are in control of you and other people are not that is a key factor for happiness or in control of your life that you choose you have choices. You choose your own destiny. You choose your own what you're going to do. Now, certainly there are determinants within which we have to choose. But one of the ways we up the thriving and happiness in senior living facilities, for example, is you give people more choices. You don't just give them the food. You give them menus and have them choose their food. Their happiness goes up. Not because of the food. Because they had choices. Provide choices to your kids. Provide choices to the people that you lead. Put people in companies. If they have a choice, their happiness goes up. Self-determination.